Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know there will be spoilers ahead. This particular episode is the official 300th episode of the podcast. Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on one of my favorite movies, The Outlaw Josie Wales, 1976. I will also do something a little different in the story as I will look at this movie in terms of the hero's journey first presented by Joseph Campbell in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, 1949. If you're unfamiliar with The Hero's Journey, it's the path that Luke took in Star Wars 1977 and Dorothy took earlier in The Wizard of Oz 1939. Today's film was directed by and starred Clint Eastwood. To me, it is a logical conclusion of the spaghetti westerns he was in, and I also believe the story was refined in Unforgiven 1992. Since this movie is long and has a large cast, we have many returning actors and a few new ones to cover. Use the link below to stop by our merch store and get one of these shirts. All the cool kids are wearing them this year. Actors. Bill McKinney played the focus of all the hate in this movie, Union Captain and Raider Red Legs Terrell. McKinney was first covered in the John Wayne epic The Shootist, 1976. However, he will most likely always be remembered for his scenes with Ned Beatty in Deliverance, 1972. Ugh. Woody Parfrey played the carpetbagger and popped up several times in this movie. He was really more of a patent medicine salesman than a carpetbagger. Buck Catterlane had a small role as a shopkeeper. Both Parfrey and Catterlane were first covered in Planet of the Apes, 1968. Great voiced actor Royal Dano played the down-on-his-luck gambler, Ten Spot. Dano was first covered in the Confederate Shelby-based John Wayne movie, The Undefeated, 1969. The classic Western and film noir tough guy, John Russell, played Bloody Bill Anderson. Russell was first covered in the average film noir, The Story of Molly X, 1949. Lynn Lesser had a small bit as Abe, a would-be bounty hunter. Lesser was first covered in the film noir, I Want to Live, 1958. Of course, he was Jerry Seinfeld's uncle in the TV series. Eric Holland popped up as a Union Army sergeant administering the oath. This actor was briefly covered in the Custard-esque movie, The Glory Guys, 1965. Clint Eastwood, who played Josie Wales and directed this movie, is the driving force in this film. Clint Eastwood was born in California in 1930. He got his start in the movies as an uncredited actor in Revenge of the Creature, 1955. Love that Gill Man. His big break came, Clint Eastwood's, not the Gill Man, when he got the role of Rowdy Yates in 1959 on Rawhide. Eastwood made three movies in Italy that kicked his career into high gear. These movies were dubbed as Spaghetti Westerns, and they are A Fistful of Dollars, 1964, For a Few Dollars More, 1965, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, 1966. These westerns allowed Eastwood to take his tough guy act to bigger audiences. He made more westerns, including the musical Paint Your Wagon, 1969, and if you haven't seen him sing, look that movie up and see it. He also made a few World War II movies, with some of the more popular stars of the time. Beginning 1971, he began directing and taking full leading man roles such as The Beguiled and Play Misty for Me. This was also the beginning of the Dirty Harry film series. Go ahead, make my day, punk. He continued making movies through the 1970s, but only High Plains Drifter 1973 and The Outlaw Josie Wales 1976 were outstanding. Then he entered his monkey phase with Every Which Way But Loose 1978. It's really an eight, but saying monkey is funnier. It was followed by Any Which Way You Can, 1980. Despite these monkey movies, he remained popular through the late 80s with films such as Firefox, 1982, Pale Rider, 1985, and Heartbreak Ridge, 1986. All big hits. After the fifth Dirty Harry, The Deadpool, 1988, Eastwood made the terrible Pink Cadillac, 1989, and The Rookie, 1990. It seemed his career was ending but he continued to work until he came out with the incredible Unforgiven 1992. He received the Best Director Oscar for this film and was nominated for the Best Actor Oscar. By the 1990s, he started making more movies befitting his age. These include The Bridges of Madison County 1995 and The Wonderful Space Cowboys 2000. Once again, it seemed that his star was fading and then he popped back with Million Dollar Baby 2004, where at the Oscars, 
he duplicated the results for Unforgiven 1992. He continued making and directing movies such as Mystic River 2003, Flags of Our Fathers 2006, and Letters from Iwo Jima 2006. He returned to acting with Gran Torino 2008, where he crushed it as a cranky old racist. He repeated this role in Trouble with the Curve 2012. Much like John Wayne, Eastwood started repeatedly working with the same group of actors. These include his former girlfriend, Sandra Locke. Chief Dan George played Cherokee Lone Waddy. The man that would later be called Chief Dan George was born in British Columbia in 1899. George was raised in a traditional Native American lifestyle. In the mid-1950s, George served as the chief of his tribe and was allowed to maintain the title of chief. At the age of 60, George acted in a play. He was then cast as Dustin Hoffman's Indian grandfather in Little Big Man 1970, and he was amazing. For this role, he was nominated for the Best Supporting Actor Oscar. He had another prominent role in The Outlaw Josie Wales 1976, and he was again terrific. George was an environmental activist and author. He died in 1981. Sandra Locke played the doe-eyed Laura Lee from Kansas. Locke was born in Tennessee in 1944. In 1962, Locke followed a male friend to MTSU, go Red Raiders. After a year, she left college for good. Locke moved to Nashville, where she modeled and did voice work. She was active in the local acting community. Locke landed her first film role in The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, 1968. She received an Oscar nomination for this role. Later, she was in Willard, 1971, a movie about rats. Locke moved to Los Angeles and continued to work in film and on television. In 1972, Locke met Clint Eastwood while he was getting ready to direct Breezy, 1973. Locke landed the role in The Outlaw Josie Wales, 1976, expecting it to spark her career. During the filming, Locke and director Eastwood became a couple. Locke appeared in a lot of Eastwood films, including The Gauntlet, 1977, Every Which Way But Loose, 1978, Any Which Way You Can, 1980, Bronco Billy, 1980, which was pretty good, and the Dirty Harry 1971 sequel, Sudden Impact 1983. Having trouble finding appropriate roles, Locke tried directing. She directed the television movie, Death in Small Doses in 1995, Trading Favors 1997, Impulse 1990, and Rat Boy 1986. I don't think it was any connection to the previous Rat movie. Locke also produced two other films. In 1988, the relationship between Locke and Eastwood ended, and it ended badly. Eastwood locked her out of their shared home the following year and had her possessions boxed and stored. Locke sued for palimony based on their 14-year relationship. The suit was settled out of court. In 1990, Locke received a cancer diagnosis. Warner Brothers failed to honor their part of the settled lawsuit, refusing to give Locke any projects. In 1995, Locke sued Eastwood for her role in the Warner Brothers deal. The case was also settled out of court as was her case against Warner Brothers. Locke worked very little, being restricted by her former partner's clout. She died in 2018 at the age of 74. John Vernon played Fletcher, a Confederate raider turned Union bounty hunter. Vernon was born in Canada in 1932. In the 1950s, he began working in theater and on television. Adept at playing tough guys and authority figures, Vernon found movie roles in films such as the neo-noir Point Blank 1967, Topaz 1969, Dirty Harry 1971, Brannigan 1975, and The Outlaw Josie Wales 1976. While in numerous other movies, he is probably best known for his role as the cockle Dean Wormer of Faber College in National Lampoon's Animal House 1978. Vernon was also a singer and musician who released several albums. He died in 2005 at the age of 72. Sam Bottoms played a young Confederate that idolized Josie Wales, named Jamie. Bottoms was born in California in 1955. In 1970, he began working on television. His first movie was The Last Picture Show 1971, and it was a major hit for him. Bottoms' other movies include The Outlaw Josie Wales 1976, Apocalypse Now 1979, Bronco Billy 1980, Gardens of Stone, 1987, and Seabiscuit, 2003. Bottoms worked on television and on stage. Sadly, this rising star died at the early age of 53 in 2008. Will Sampson was pretty impressive in the role of Ten Bears. 
Sampson was born in Oklahoma in 1933 and was a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Sampson began his acting career with an uncredited role in Crazy Mama 1975. It was not long until he was cast in essential roles in films such as One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest 1975, The Outlaw Josie Wales 1976, The White Buffalo 1977, and Poltergeist 2: The Other Side 1986. Sampson remained active with film and television, working until he sadly passed away at 53 in 1987. What the f story? It is evident that director Clint Eastwood masterfully wove the elements of the hero's journey into a compelling narrative of redemption and revenge. I will explore this film adhering to Campbell's outline, highlighting its strength and impact on the Western genre. The Outlaw Josie Wales 1976 is among the top Westerns ever filmed. Still, the Western part only represents about half of the film. This film is based on the Forrest Carter book, The Rebel Outlaw Josie Wales 1972. Reissued as Gone to Texas 1975. Thanks to the internet, I found out that Carter was a horrible racist and active in the Ku Klux Klan. He wrote speeches for George Wallace and even ran against him because he thought he was getting too soft. I do not endorse any of his hateful, stupid, and dangerous ideas. When the movie begins, the Civil War is already in full bloom. Missouri came into the Union as a slave state and Kansas was admitted as a free state. John Brown of Harper's Ferry fame was actively raiding in the area leading up to the war. The origins. In the movie, Josie Wales, Clint Eastwood, lived in a slave state without enslaving people. Josie does not choose to live in the free state. He seems to want to be left alone while the world chaos swirls around him and his family. This idea is shown in Shenandoah, 1965. James Stewart's character tries to sit out the war in Northern Virginia with disastrous results. Josie had a blonde wife and a tow-headed son, played by his own son, and an old mule. One day while he was working in the field, a large group of mounted raiders from Kansas descended on Josie's farm. The raiders are wearing red leggings and are referred to by that name. Josie is powerless to help his wife, who is assumed to be raped before she is murdered. The Redlegs also killed Josie's son. The leader of the Redlegs is Terrell, Bill McKinney, who happens to have red hair and a red beard to match his legging. He strikes Josie on the face with a saber. This permanently scars Josie and sends him to the ground unconscious. Later, Josie buries his wife and son before retrieving a revolver from his burned cabin. He practices shooting at a post until he feels ready for revenge. However, Josie doesn't know how. He has lived in an idyllic world and will now be forced to change. For a note, this pistol practice scene is reused in Unforgiven 1992. However, realizing his eyesight has worsened, as it's happened to all of us, he destroys the stump with a shotgun, the call to adventure. While Josie grieves, a group of Southern Raiders arrive at his farm. The leader of the group is Bloody Bill Anderson, John Russell. The Confederates are modeled after Quantrell's Raiders. The Raiders tell Josie that they are going north to set things right. Josie accepts the call to adventure with the understated, I reckon I'll be coming with y'all. As the credits begin to roll, a montage shows the Confederate Raiders winning and taking revenge. At the same time, in the East, the Band of Blue Angels is shown repeatedly beating the now outnumbered Confederate. Bloody Bill is shown dying from a wound with Josie at his side. Fletcher, John Vernon, takes over the group but it should have been Josie because he is the best fighter and the most respected in the group. The images continue showing successful Confederate raiding, but there are always more Union soldiers and artillery. Paraphrasing Rhett Butler, artillery will mean a lot to a lot of gentlemen. Finally, the Confederates are only shown going backward. Later, the Confederate raiders are sitting around a campfire. The dress they are wearing is an homage to the iconography of the Lost Cause. They have old pappy smoking corncob pipes, youngsters that should be at home, artillery piping, infantry piping, every kind of hat, and the intelligent look of grade school dropouts. Fletcher rides into camp and tells him that they are the last holdout. He said he is surrendering and any man that takes the oath will be given amnesty. All the men except Josie and the young Jamie, Sam Bottoms, start preparing to go in. Jamie looks to Josie for advice. Josie tells Jamie to surrender even though he is not going in himself. Fletcher reminds Josie that the Union will hunt him down and there is nowhere to run. Here's where the first issue with the hero's journey enters. Was Josie called to war? 
and he wishes to continue until he is killed? Or does he have another call that is not revealed yet? Refusal of the call. Using a telescope, Josie watches his band members surrender to what appears to be regular Union soldiers. However, he sees red legs moving around the tents and wagons in the background. In the camp, Fletcher is paid by vengeful Senator Lane, Frank Schofield, who looks a lot like Robert Ryan. Terrell emerges from a tent, and Fletcher is incensed that Northern Raiders are present, not traditional troops. Fletcher tells that Josie didn't come in with the others, and a slight twinge of fear shoots through Terrell's face. The Confederate Raiders are being disarmed on the other side of the camp. Jamie doesn't want to take the oath, but is forced to go along with the others. Union Army Sergeant Eric Holland starts administering the oath as red legs move into tents and wagons surrounding the Southern Raiders. Jamie sees Josie riding towards the camp at a full gallop. The Union Army Sergeant continues with the oath saying, though I be lying, verminous, Missouri scum, as he gives the signal for the red legs to open fire. Gatlin guns open up from some wagons while other red legs fire from tents. As the former Confederates fall in the hail of bullets, Josie kills an operator and begins killing red legs with one of the Gatlin guns. Josie missed the call to peace, which was a ruse anyway. He takes up the call of revenge, knowing he will die in the process. Terrell and Senator Lane hold Fletcher when he reacts to the betrayal. Jamie makes it to a horse and rides to warn Fletcher of the trap. The warning hardly seems necessary, as guns have been firing for about 10 minutes at this point. It's a trap! After Jamie's warning, he is shot in the back by Terrell. Josie is busy sending dozens of Yankees to the promised land when Jamie rides up and tells Josie that Fletcher is in on the trap. Jamie says he is scared of dying. Josie changes his calling from dying to kill more of his enemies to living and killing a lot more of his enemies. He is all in for revenge. The Red Legs close in on the Gatlin gun wagon, but Josie and Jamie have fled into the safety of the brush. Fletcher realizes that the war will never be over until Josie is killed. Fletcher says a man like Wales lives for the feud. Fletcher continues that because of what the Senator and Terrell have done, he must kill Wales. The Senator puts out a $5,000 bounty on Wales. Bound this Wales to kingdom come. Because of what you did here today, I've got to kill that man. Well, he'll have to run for it now. And hell is where he's headed. Jamie and Josie move slowly through the brush country, partly because of Jamie's wounds and partly because of dozens of mounted Union patrols are looking for the fugitive. Josie plans to head to the Indian nations, Oklahoma. Jamie plans on joining in the revenge. Josie uses his knowledge of warfare to evade a Union patrol by making the horses lie down. Jamie feels good traveling with Josie, even though he's badly wounded. Ferryman Sim Carstairs, played by William O'Connell, was a regular Eastwood Stock Group member. Sim is watching the ferry come across the river and telling of the tribulations of ferrying both sides across the river during a war to a traveling salesman known as Carpetbagger, played by Woodrow Parfrey. The Carpetbagger is really only a salesman and not a land speculator. The Carpetbagger is heading to Texas and selling patent medicine. As Josie and Jamie ride up, Sim begins singing Dixie. Josie takes Jamie and Sim to a small store by the ferry. Josie sends a list of what is needed. Granny Hawkins, Madeline Taylor Holmes, comes out of the store and calls Josie by his name. She says she knows who he is because soldiers had been by earlier looking for him. In addition to the information, Granny Hawkins gives poultices for Jamie's wound. She says the Yankees talk big, but are short on action. When Josie tries to pay for his supplies, the elderly Granny Hawkins says, Pay me when you see me, Josie Wales. Granny Hawkins is amused, and she has given Josie a gift from the gods, like Jason's wishes in Jason and the Argonauts, 1963, and Perseus's helmet in Clash of the Titans, 1981. Josie, Jamie, and the carpetbaggers load onto the barge to cross the large river. Sim continues to sing Dixie. The carpetbagger tries to sell patent medicine to Josie for Jamie by saying it is a wonder drug. Josie spits tobacco on the man's white suit and asks if it also cleans stains. The ferry barely makes it to the other shore when Union forces arrive and start screaming for the ferryman to bring the watercraft back to them. Sim says he will hold up as long as he can. Halfway across the river, Sim switches to Battle Hymn of the Republic. Josie lays down to take a nap on the side of the river. On the other side of the river, Terrell tells Fletcher that they are going to Texas after Josie to hunt more ex-Confederates. When Terrell says that doing right ain't got no end, Granny Hawkins laughs in his face. The Union cavalry begins to cross the river. 
When Fletcher sees Josie taking a nap on the other side, he advises Terrell to turn back. Josie gets a special sniper rifle off his horse. As the carpetbagger cleans his coat, he says there's something called justice and Josie can't get away. Josie says they have something here called a Missouri boat ride. He then shoots, cutting the rope and sending the ferry downriver. Josie and Jamie spend the night by the river. They treat Jamie's wounds and the youth tells about his father embroidering his shirt before he joined the army. Jamie says his father sang Rose of Alabama as he sewed. Josie hears something, but before he can react, he is set upon by bounty hunter Abe, Lynn Lesser, and Lige, Doug McGrath. Lige wants to shoot Josie as the bounty is good, even if he is dead. We got the Josie whales, Abe. We got reward money coming. Abe wants to stand up to the famous fighter. Josie has to drop his gun belt, and Abe relaxes. Lige calls for a third bounty hunter. Jamie starts singing. When Lige kicks him, Jamie says, Pa, I got the gold me and Josie stole. Josie says the kid is crazy. Lige pulls the blanket back and is shot by Jamie. Josie pulls a hidden pistol and dispatches Abe. The third man hightails it through the brush. These beatings of the enemy show that Josie is the right person to undertake the quest by being the strongest and the bravest, crossing the threshold. The two men continue westward as a hard rainstorm pelts them. The pair bed down for the night on the border of the Indian Territory. Union Cavalry is camped between the outlaws and the territory. Jamie makes peace with his impending death and dies later that night. Sad about the loss of his friend, Josie uses Jamie's body and horse to cross the Union line guarding the border to the Indian Territory. Josie straps Jamie's body to a horse and gives him a small eulogy before sending the horse and body galloping into camp. While the soldiers chase a decoy, Josie calmly rides through the camp and into the territory. This is a critical point because Josie has lost his last companion from his past and has not yet met his mentor. Crossing the line of soldiers is symbolic of crossing the river of death, a process Josie must complete to find his way back to a new beginning. This symbolic death is slightly out of sequence. Most heroes only pass the threshold with the help of their mentor. Josie's true mentor lies ahead in his journey, meeting the mentor. Inside the Indian Territory, an elderly Indian, Lone Wadi, Chief Dan George, Here's Josie approaching his cabin. Armed with a rifle, Lone Waddy searches through the woods for Josie. Josie sends his horse towards the Indian as he sneaks up on the man with the rifle. Josie holds a pistol on Lone Waddy. The Cherokee has heard of Josie and is greatly disturbed because white men keep sneaking up on him and his tribe. Lone Waddy finishes his tale of how his land was stolen and his wife and sons died on the Trail of Tear. Seeing that Lone Waddy is not a threat, and he has a similar backstory to Josie, the outlaw settles down to sleep. Josie is asleep before Long Waddy finishes his story. Lone Waddy is Josie's mentor and can be trusted completely. Back in the Union Cavalry camp, Terrell is telling Fletcher that his men killed Jamie when he tried to sneak past and there is no way Wales can be in the Indian Territory. Recognizing the trick, Fletcher laughs and heads for the Territory to search for Whale. Terrell says he will be heading to the Territories as well. In the morning, Lone Waddy burns his long coat and top hat and dresses in a more western outfit. Lone Waddy is able to sneak up on the sleeping Josie. Lone Waddy says that the horned toad says they should head to Mexico. Josie says that Lone Waddy can go wherever he wants, but Josie says he has business in Missouri. Lone Waddy tells him that Shelby and some other militant confederates are heading to Mexico. Now, for full disclosure, the name of the National Guard camp where I was raised was Camp Shelby after that Confederate. There is a decent John Wayne Rock Hudson movie inspired by this story called The Undefeated 1969. After the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, Shelby was involved in the pre-war border raiding between Kansas and Missouri. After the war, Shelby and about a thousand men offered their services to Emperor Maximilian and were given land. About two years later, Emperor Maximilian's illegal regime fell to Mexican patriots and Shelby returned to America. He was a witness at the Frank James trial as both Frank and Jesse James were Confederate raiders from Missouri. Back to the movie. Josie allows his new mentor to come along, but Lone Waddy doesn't have a horse. Josie leaves for the local trading post to get another horse. During this mission, Josie has to face another challenge by himself and the size of his group grows to three. At the trading post, the agent, Zuki Limmer, Charles Tyner, is swindling the local natives with his deal. Zuki has a young woman that works for him named Little Moonlight, Geraldine Keems. She brings out two bottles of rot gut whiskey, but drops and breaks one. 
Zuki gives the booze to the Indian traders to continue to rip them off. Zuki slaps Little Moonlight to the ground, beating her with a flat piece of wood. He is stopped by the sound of Josie's horse. Josie sees the plight of Little Moonlight with a look of disgust. Zuki goes inside the dark trading post where two bearskin wearing Caucasians are making themselves at home and demanding credit. When Little Moonlight comes in with more whiskey, the two white traders want to buy her. Zuki tries to explain that the young female works for him and he doesn't own her. One of the traders points out that Little Moonlight has a knife scar on her left nostril. He says that means she is a loose woman to the Cheyenne. They drag her to the back and start to rape her. The door swings open wide and Josie walks in to buy a horse. Zuki says the horses belong to the traders. Josie walks to the back. Little Moonlight's eyes plead for help. Josie spits tobacco juice, a recurring theme, onto the ground, stopping the assault. The two traders stop what they are doing and pull pistols on Josie, knowing he has a $5,000 reward on his head. Well, the one that everyone's so scared of now. They order Josie to pull his guns out butt first. He does, but then does a flip and twist move, gunning down both traders. Zuki no longer wants a share of the reward, just hoping to get out alive. Little Moonlight sees that Josie is a warrior worth traveling with. Near the trading post, Josie hides in the woods as Red Leg Cavalry rides to the post. Lone Wadi pulls a pistol on Josie, saying he is getting better at sneaking up on people now that he has returned to his Indian ways. Another pistol cocks, and Little Moonlight has a gun on Lone Wadi. Josie wants to disband the group, but Lone Wadi says he is going along, but Little Moonlight definitely can't come. Little Moonlight explains that she is a Navajo who was captured by the Cheyenne. They marked her after she was violated by an Arapaho. The three camp for the night, and Little Moonlight never stops talking. Little Moonlight believes she owes Josie for saving her, and she wants him to know she is a virtuous woman. In the hero's journey, Little Moonlight is another goddess sent to help the hero. However, she doesn't act much until later, almost like an ace card that can be played when needed. Test allies and enemies. In the morning, a hound dog has joined the traveling band. The group rides across the open plain until they arrive at a lonely boom town. The town is full of wild cowboys, Indians, traders, settlers, former Confederates, and active Union soldiers. Josie also spots red legs. On the sidewalk outside of the store, Josie spits tobacco. He is scolded by Grandma Sarah, Paula Truman, who is traveling west with her homely granddaughter, Laura Lee, Sandra Locke, and some more family. Grandma Sarah is from Kansas and hates everything from Missouri. In the store, Josie is given a fright when the storekeeper, Buck Catterlane, blurts out the name Josie Wales. The shopkeeper is only spreading the news that the outlaw is presumed to be heading their way. On the street, the carpetbagger tries to sell patent medicine to Lone Waddy. Josie leaves the store with his hands full of packages. The carpetbagger sees Josie and screams to the town that, It's Josie Wales! With his hands full, Josie faces down four Union soldiers. When they draw, he kills three immediately, and Lone Waddy shoots the one on the left. Josie and Lone Waddy ride out of town, but Little Moonlight is knocked down by the pursuing Union forces and kicked in the head by a horse. The two men are sad that the young woman will no longer be around. Josie says that every time he starts liking someone, they aren't around for long. Lone Waddy replies that every time Josie gets to not liking someone, they ain't around for long either. Whenever I get to liking someone, they ain't around long. I notice when you get to disliking someone, they ain't around for long either. Lone Waddy asked Josie how he knew which one of the four Union soldiers would shoot first. Josie explains that the one in the center had a flap on his holster. The second one from the left had scared eyes, but the one on the far left had crazy eyes. Josie said he never paid no mind to the one on the right because he knew Lone Waddy was there. There'll be more about this later. Not long after the gunfight, Fletcher and Terrell arrive in the town with more red leg cavalry. Terrell says Wales is not hard to track because he leaves dead men everywhere he goes. Well, not a hard man to track. Leaves dead men wherever he goes. Fletcher points out that there are a lot of bounty hunters joining the hunt for Wales. Two bounty hunters watch the cavalry leave. Lone Waddy listens to the ground and says they are being followed by two horses moving fast. They ride out into a large sand area like Great Sand Dunes National Park. Heaven forbid, 
They see the horses moving towards them, but they continue onward to set up an ambush. A single rider approaches with another horse in tow. Lone Waddy jumps on the rider, but it turns out to be Little Moonlight. She beats the old chief easily. That night, the two men watch Little Moonlight washing in the creek. They talk about having an edge in a fight and in life. When it's dark, Josie goes to where Little Moonlight is sleeping. He's too late, as Lone Waddy has already started dating the young woman. The group continues into southwest Texas en route to Mexico. Lone Waddy says they are in Comanche territory. Little Moonlight sees wagon tracks and says they are from Comancheros, bandits that trade with the hostile Indian tribe. It is not long before the group sees the Comancheros. They have captured Granny Sarah. They have also killed all of the men traveling with her group. Criminals find Laura Lee hiding in the wagon. They begin to strip and assault her. Josie prepares to open fire from where he is hiding, but the head Comanchero, John Quaid, another Eastwood stock player, wants to sell Laura Lee to Tin Bears and stops the attack. Lone Waddy knocks a rock loose in his hiding place and gets captured by the Comancheros. Josie follows the group of criminals in the cart. Lone Waddy, Laura Lee, and Grandma Sarah are tied to a cart and are making the long trek on foot. Josie appears in front of the criminals with the sun at his back. The criminal leader sends out four men, including well-known stuntman Richard Farnsworth. Josie has a white flag tied to his rifle. Lone Waddy tells Grandma Sarah that hell is coming to breakfast. Josie opens up and sends the four men to hell. He rides in with his pistols blazing and sends the rest along as well. A Hispanic bandit runs from Josie and Little Moonlight sends him along. Get out of the way, woman. Grandma Sarah thinks Josie is going to kill them as well. With two new members of the group, Josie continues towards Mexico. Grandma Sarah's destination is her dead son's ranch near Santa Rio. Josie doesn't believe that a decent place exists this far out in the West. Josie and the group make it to the mostly abandoned town of Santo Rio. The two bounty hunters from the other town are waiting. Singing is coming from the Lost Lady Saloon, so Josie takes the group in there. Inside are a saloon girl, Rose, Joyce Jameson, Ten Spot, Royal Dano, Kelly, Matt Clark, Travis Cobb, Sheb Woolley, and Chato, John Veros. They don't have whiskey or beer and are hanging around with nowhere else to go. Josie brings in whiskey that he liberated from the Comancheros. Rose tells Grandma Sarah that she knew her son well. Grandma doesn't believe that her son would consort with a saloon girl. Chato and Travis had worked for Grandma's son. Josie sees the two bounty hunters heading towards the saloon. The first bounty hunter, John Chandler, comes into the saloon to face Josie. Josie tells the bounty hunter that dying ain't much of a living, boy. You're wanted, Wales. You a bounty hunter? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Dying ain't much of a living, boy. The bounty hunter leaves, but he has to come back to face Josie. Josie outdraws him easily. The second bounty hunter runs away. As the group, with Travis and Chato now along, heads to the ranch. They are scouted by Comanche. Chato tells that Tin Bears, Will Sampson, is the leader of the tribe and is angry about the lies told by Union negotiators. When the group arrives at the ranch, Josie sees it is built like a blockhouse and can withstand an attack. Grandma starts cleaning and making it a home. Grandma tells Lone Waddy that the ranch is home to all of them, but Josie says he will be leaving. As they settle in, Josie remembers his family in Missouri. Laura Lee flirts with Josie, but she's kind of odd. Travis, Chato, and Lone Waddy leave with some cattle. Grandma thanks God for turning Josie away from being a murderous bushwhacker. Later, Lone Waddy gallops back into the ranch. He says Tin Bears has captured Travis and Chato and will attack in the morning. Josie assigns firing positions to all the people in the house. He also explains how to get mean and live. He says that if anybody gets wounded, sing out and they'll slap hot iron to it, the quickest way to stop the blood. Approach to the innermost cave. In the morning, Josie rises early and leaves the ranch, knowing he can do more to defend the property, ranging freely on his horse. Leaving Laura Lee behind, Josie rides directly to the Comanche camp. Ten Bears emerges from the teepee as Josie approaches. Travis and Chato are buried in the ground to their chins. Josie tells Ten Bear that they can live together or die together. 
Tin Bear knows Josie is a man of honor because of how he lives as a warrior. Tin Bear makes peace with Josie and the ranchers. Metaphorically, when Josie meets with Tin Bears, he enters a cave where he does battle with himself. Josie has been wronged, but Tin Bears has been treated worse. Josie can make amends with one group, although he can't save himself yet. Josie returns to the ranch with Chato and Travis. Laura Lee shows Josie she cares. They have a branding party that includes the town folk. Laura Lee braids Josie a watch chain with her hair. They dance to the tune, The Rose of Alabama, a song that Jamie sang before he died. Fletcher, Daryl, and the second bounty hunters and a bunch of redlegs arrive at the now empty town. Laura Lee and Josie spend time together. They get all sexy. Later, Josie dreams of death in the past. He looks at the sleeping Laura Lee and prepares to ride out. Lone Waddy and Josie have a tearful goodbye knowing they will never see each other again. Josie rides away from the ranch. Ordeal and reward. On the dry lake bed in front of the cabin, Terrell is waiting for Josie. A very large group of red leg riders arrive to support Terrell. I haven't mentioned this before because I want to get to this ordeal section first. Terrell and Josie are twin brothers like Loki and Thor, Vulcan and Mars, or Gilgamesh and Enkidu. We have no sympathy for Terrell, but hasn't he lived through the same attacks in the border war? He just happens to be on the side that won and can use the government's power to finish his revenge. Remember that Josie was planning on returning to Missouri for revenge, therefore Josie is facing his final ordeal. Still, there are also elements of the cave where he faces himself in the person of Terrell. The baker's dozen of riders come within feet of Josie. Suddenly from the cabin, all the gun ports are filled with rifle. Josie spits and begins firing with both pistols. The rifles in the house open up as well. Josie falls to the ground but keeps firing. The red legs are beaten and driven away from the ranch. Only Terrell and one or two others survive the first contact. You're all alone now, Wells. Not quite alone. <laughs> Josie is wounded in the side. Despite his wounds and emptying his pistols, Josie mounts a horse and chases Terrell into Santa Rio. Josie sees blood and trails the also wounded Terrell. Josie gets the drop on the Union officer and begins dry firing his pistols as Terrell recoils in fear. As he does, Josie relives the trauma of having his Missouri family killed. Josie goes through four pistols and 24 clicks. Terrell faces death each time. This repeated gun firing with rounds was used in the concentration camp scene where Private Griff, played by Mark Hamill, worked through his trauma in the Big Red One, 1980. When he is sure Josie's guns are empty, Terrell tries to pull his sword, which he scarred Josie with at the beginning of the movie. Josie overpowers Terrell and stabs the sword vertically into Terrell's torso. With Terrell dead, Josie is free from the hate cycle. The wounded Josie goes into the saloon. Tenspot is telling two Texas Rangers how the outlaw Josie Wells was killed by pistoleros. They introduce the wounded Josie as Mr. Wilson. Another man is revealed in the shadows. It is Fletcher. The two rangers are happy with the story, but Fletcher says he doesn't believe five pistol arrows could kill Josie Wales. Rose replies, maybe it was six. Maybe it was ten. As Josie watches, Fletcher says he thinks Josie is still alive and he is going to Mexico to keep looking for the outlaw. Fletcher says that Josie is owed the first move. He continues that he will tell Josie the war is over if he ever meets the man. Josie rides away into the sunset, having dealt with his demons. He is on the road back, but you never know where he went. Did Josie return to the ranch or wander away? Also, the blood dripping from his side carries on the resurrection theme, but again, we never know if he died. Or is he a ghost that travels around setting things right, maybe like High Plains Drifter? The last step in the hero's journey would be returning with the elixir, living out his life with Laura Lee. We will never know. Conclusion. Clint Eastwood's The Outlaw Josie Wales, 1976, 
masterfully employs Joseph Campbell's hero's journey to craft a compelling Western film. Through the film's adherence to the stages of the hero's journey, Eastwood takes the audience on a transformative journey alongside the protagonist. From the devastating loss that propels Josie into action to his ultimate redemption and pursuit of justice, The Outlaw Josie Wales 1976 captures the essence of the hero's transformative journey, creating a timeless tale of resilience, revenge, and redemption that solidifies its status as a Western classic. Lone Waddy asked Josie how he knew which one of the four Union soldiers would shoot first. Near the end of Unforgiven 1992, Money, Clint Eastwood, kills five men in a gunfight. Afterwards, the reporter Saul Rubnick asked him how he knew which to kill first. Money says he was lucky in the order and he never really thought about it. I believe this is a direct tribute to the outlaw Josie Wales 1976 and that the concept of the Josie character evolved from the spaghetti westerns through the outlaw Josie Wales and finally to Unforgiven 1992. Real famous short summary, you gonna pull those pistols or whistle Dixie? Beware of the moors. There'll be some boxes and circles up here. The first one is a recommended movie by the mathematics over there at YouTube. The next one is a playlist related to this movie. And the third one is a subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when I put out new content.